growing up was competitive. Mm. My dad is different. My dad is uh, everything was a competition. Like even as a baby sitting in the high chair, he would put food and you would grab it and he would pull it away. <laughs> and you'd like, he would be like, plumber, you got to take it. You got to take it if you want it. And, you know, I laugh now because it's such a symbol for life. I, so I was young, I think I was probably 10 or 11, and I was trying out for a basketball team that was like under 14 or 15, like significant age gap. And I was good enough to be on the team, but I remember the coaches brought me in to like a meeting uh, for the club, and they wanted to talk to me because they're like, hey, this is a big age gap. We want to just make sure mentally and emotionally, like you're going to be able to be a good teammate and handle. And so I remember they bringing me in and um, one of the coaches was like, well, what do you want to do? Like, what's your aspiration? And I was like, I'm going to go play for Pat Summit and then I'm going to play in the league. Like, that's what I'm going to do. And I remember she started laughing. Like the coach started laughing at me. And I was like, I literally was like, what's so funny? And she's like, do you know how many kids want to do that? And I'm like, sure, millions. Okay. And she was just like, yeah, basically like, look at you. You know, like at the time I was probably like 5'4", and I mean, I'm white, and I was just so pissed off. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, you're laughing at me. And I remember I went home and told my parents, and they were just like, prove it wrong. And I didn't play for Pat Summit, but I did make it to the league, and uh, that definitely was like a big moment in my life because that right there, I made the decision. I was like, oh, no, nah, she's wrong. So I think for me um, – if you were to ask me going into college what it was going to be like, I, I had no idea it was going to be like that. They named me a captain right when I showed up. Oh. And it was like social suicide. And I just remember thinking, like, God, why? Why? Like, I didn't ask for this. This mm -hmm. wasn't. And there, the coach's idea was you're strong enough to handle it, and we're going to change the culture, and it's going to be with you. And um, it was really hard. It was really hard. Um, I think for me – uh, my college career, it's built a lot of character, but don't get me wrong, like, there were moments I, I didn't think, like, I was depressed, suicidal, heavy antidepressants, antidepressants, sleeping medications, like, to get through, and it ultimately became, like, my decline, and then, obviously, I'm, I'm back, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was brutal to put that much pressure on a kid, and then to perform, and then, of course, you know, People see, like, the scoring, and that's, like, a, the new expectation, you know? And so I just remember, like, I was on campus. I had a camera crew following me around, coming into class with me in the Seattle Times of how many points I needed to have to continue to break the record. And, like, I'm not paying attention to these things, but you got everybody else in the world paying attention to it. And I'd have professors say, hey, 150 more, you got it. And I'm like, does anyone see me? You know what I mean? Like, does anyone care? But ultimately, the whole experience has definitely forged who I am and what I've been through and what I know I continue to go through because, I mean, I mean, I wouldn't be here if I didn't go through that. Countdown. Draft day probably was one of my all-time lows. Um, I remember being drafted. You are chasing something for so long, and I feel like the satisfaction I thought I was going to get for whatever, scoring those points, breaking those records, winning those awards, getting drafted number one, was going to fix my emptiness or the lack of identity that I had for myself. You know, I literally had no idea who I was if basketball wasn't happening. And when it did all happen, it it was like even more of a reassurance, <clears throat> excuse me, that I'm just, I feel like nothing. I feel so worthless. I feel so um, empty and I did everything I was supposed to do and I'm supposed to be happy right now and I'm not. And it was just, it was just terrible. I got drafted to San Antonio um, and we lived at, uh, this apartment and it was attached to a parking structure and it was probably like seven or eight floors high and I lived on the seventh or eighth floor 
And so when I drove on the parking structure, I would just drive up to the top and park. And I remember um, I would just sit out at night on top of the structure and just dangle my legs over and just cry. And then I would just call random people in my phone. And I remember one night I called um, Markel Fultz. Me and him were really close um, in college. And I thought it was the night. I thought it was it. And I just remember like thinking to myself, it's funny now. Well, it's not funny now, but I can laugh at it now. Like, I'm like, man, if I jump and my mom obviously will know she'll kill me again. Like, <laughs> and in my mind, I just kept thinking like, there's gotta be more to this. There's gotta be something else. Like I, I, I can't let this be it. This is not what takes me out. Like I've, I was like, I worked too hard to get to this spot and let this parking structure be the, the reason that I go. And I, it, it took me, I still don't know necessarily how I kind of got back in I mean, I just would pray. I would just sit up there and I would just pray like, and cry. And then I'd go to practice the next day. And, and, the, and the worst part about it, I think for me, is that I'm such a private person that I didn't tell anybody. Like nobody. Nobody knew I was going through this. Nope. People just thought I wasn't that good at basketball anymore. You know? Was, oh, she's just the translation to college and the pro is just not working for her. Right. And I, really, I just was... I was just hanging on by a thread. So that was probably Lewis. I realized that I lived in the victim mentality. I realized that it was the blame game. It was like, well, coach doesn't mess with me and this girl doesn't want to pass me the ball and, and you know, my knee's partially torn and, you know, I'm going, th I'm going on like just this family stuff or like it was always something that was wrong. And I just finally, I think I got to the point where I realized no one's gonna help me. This is like, I gotta figure this out. Like I can't keep blaming stuff or I'm, I'll be out the league, you know, I'll be done. And I think that transition of thought and just really saying like, I'm gonna take responsibility for what's going on in my life and get better and just be a dog. The Achilles was the best thing that ever happened to me. The best thing that ever happened to me because I'm a goer. Like I wanna, I wanna move, I wanna go, I don't get tired, I can go all day. And that literally forced me to sit down. Mm -hmm. This is terrible. And I just finally had to come to grips with what was happening. And I had to like force myself to find something outside of basketball because I'm like, this is, this is it. And then and then from there, um, I mean, you know the story. Like I came back and everything was everything was Gucci, but the Achilles reset my mindset for reality mm. and my perspective on gratitude, my ability to be present. Mm. Um, I think the awareness wasn't where it needed to be. Um, I got to rebuild myself mentally, spiritually, physically. And it, today like I still believe it's, it, was a gift, it was a gift from God. Like it was a gift from God that I tore my Achilles. I'm not gonna lie, I don't know about you guys, but there are moments where I have to like, wait a second, like don't go back, you know? Don't go back, like where, where are you? Meditation has been huge for me. I get up, I like to be outside. I like to hear the birds chirp. Mm. I meditate for 10, 15 minutes. I write down 10 things I'm grateful for. And I try, <laughs> some days it's harder than others, but I try to make it um, more diverse. You know what I mean? <laughs> Can't just be grateful for the same thing every day. Um, and then I also write down, I work with a, a coach and I write down interferences, mm -hmm. things that get in the way of me being present for the day or potential interferences. And so for example, I mean, a lot of times it is performance-based, but there's things in life, you know? So I think, um, you know, for example, say we're playing a game, we're playing against Dallas or something. So I know I'm gonna be guarding this girl and I know that she's gonna try to get me in foul trouble. So what's a possible interference? I'm in foul trouble on the bench. How am I gonna, how am I gonna 
uh, prepare my mind for that or uh, possible interference. I don't know, turn the ball over a couple times to start the game or possible interference. I get in an argument with my mom in the morning. How is that going to change the direction of my day? Just little things like that. And um, that's been really big for me, being present and being in the moment. Um, and it's changed the quality of my days. And that's like a lifelong thing that I will never, I will never give that up.